Hello, everyone. This is Dale Byron, and this is Dale Byron's Poetry Podcast, a fresh glimpse of knowing. Well, I'm thrilled to be here, and I'm especially thrilled to have you all here as well as we kick off this first ever episode. I want to share what I've learned over 25 plus years working with people in poetry in mostly non-traditional ways in organizations, university settings, community settings, and even the occasional political rally. For one thing, and I think a very important thing, I've learned that facts alone, no matter how true or rational or compelling, that facts alone will not have us change in any sustained way how we feel and ultimately, as I like to say, our dance steps or how we act in the world. In other words, when it comes to this most important and critical issues or the most important and critical issues in our personal and community lives, we don't just need the logical linear facts and the figures for our intellect or the head, as we say. We also need intuitive, nonlinear, creative visions, sounds, and images for the heart as well. And that is exactly where poetry and this podcast enter the scene. As we marry the head and the heart the facts, and the poetic vision together. So let's dig right in with this inaugural podcast where we use great poetry to clarify, inspire, and address a particular critical issue in our lives each episode. This one is entitled A Stealth Guide to Healing Our Connection with the Natural World. Well, as always, we'll start with a few facts, in this case, difficult facts, of which we have way too many to choose from. There are seven what we could kind of call meta-facts, and the first one is this. Five billion humans will face water shortage, it's estimated, by the year 2050. That's a little less than 30 years from now. The sixth great extinction event human-caused, is currently underway. Since 1970, number three, since 1970, there's been a 60% decline in animal population around the world. Number four is that the annihilation of coral reefs, again, worldwide, is actually occurring right now. Number five, without a significant change, 95% of Earth's land will be degraded by 2050, again, a little less than 30 years. And by that 2050 date, and this to me is mind-boggling, to say the least, there will be more plastic than fish in our oceans. The last meta fact around this subject is that, and related to number six, is that one half of all marine life has been lost in the last 40 years. Now, these are pretty devastating facts. And uh, we ask the question are these kinds of logical, linear statements and facts important? Of course they are. Yes, they are absolutely important and critical that we confront them. But do we also need to hitch up our non-linear, intuitive, imaginal, imaginal and emotional selves as well? Yes, that's the very point of this podcast, as we've been saying. In fact, I often like to use the image of um, using poetry to fly up underneath 
the radar screen in a stealth way, the radar screen of our logical linear minds. And uh, as they fly up underneath that radar screen, they can go directly into the heart to do their thing. Again, why? Well, what I've observed, and I'm curious if you've seen this too or experienced this, is that if all we get around this subject in particular, linear logical facts, it seems to me that it's much more easy to oscillate between a stance of full-on denial on one end of the spectrum or being caught in a kind of frozen despair on the other. And we know that neither of those stances is helpful. So what say the poets on this subject? Well, they've got a lot of things to say, and I've chosen some things to focus on in this podcast. There's many to choose from, but what can they add? What can the poets add, speak differently about? And why would we want to pay any of our precious attention to these poets? Well, let's turn to a brilliant contemporary poet, David Wagner, who once said these lines in a poem he called Lost. Let's see what this might add. The poem goes like this. Stand still, stand still, the trees ahead and the bushes beside you are not lost. Wherever you are, wherever you are, is called here. And you must treat it, and you must treat it as a powerful stranger. Seek to know it and to be known. The forest breathes. Listen, it answers. Listen, it answers. I have made this place around you. If you leave it, you may come back again, saying, Here. Here. No two trees are the same to raven. No two branches are the same to wren. If what a tree or a bush does is lost on you, you are surely lost. Stand still. Stand still. The forest knows, knows where you are. You must let it find you. Now, I think this particular poem by David Wagner, again, who is an amazing poet, um, does something that the great poet Emily Dickinson talked about, which is tell the truth, but tell it slant. And that's why I use the term stealth in uh, the title of today's podcast. And it seems to me that the healing that we're talking about, healing our relationship with the natural world, requires such beauty and truth, or as much beauty and truth as we can muster. It's really an honoring of the reality that we currently face. And I think Wagner's poem really gets into this territory deeply. First of all, the very term lost. I mean, how else can we describe our relationship with the natural world rather than or other than saying that we are lost? And when when Wagner talks about or the you know the speaker in the poem talks about the forest, it's with such great reverence that the trees have their own wisdom. In fact, it kind of stops us in our tracks to hear a line like that, that the trees ahead and the bushes beside you are not lost. You know, when we do get lost, you know, literally uh, in some place, particularly uh forest or someplace like that, 
the tendency that we have is to begin to get frenetic, to run here and run there, often in circles, trying, trying, trying to find our way. But what would it be like if we leaned on and leaned into the forest as a wise being in and of itself, as the trees and bushes being wise beings in and of themselves. We see the folly of thinking of trees in this poem as the folly of thinking of trees as being dumb, exploitable things. And what we also see is that it, this line that I love, it talks about uh, you must treat it, you must treat the forest as a powerful stranger. Seek to know it and be known. Well, that's the whole idea of respect. We respect the forest as a living being, not a natural resource as we sometimes refer to trees and forests. What a slight. Uh, and also, as, it's, as it talks about that um, no two trees are the same to ro- raven, no two branches are the same to wren. If what a tree or a branch does is lost on you, oh, you are truly lost. Um, that, to me, back to the natural resource uh, term that we use, that is a pushing back against that kind of slight. And it says that no that if we don't know the purpose of these things, then we are completely and surely lost. And also, that if we really stop and get quiet, that we realize that we and the forest are not separate, and that if we allow the forest to find us, it will do so. Now, again, I want to point out, of course, that we started off this podcast by talking about the facts, some very specific, logical, linear facts, which are, as we said, devastating, of course. But we're beginning now to add to that this poetic vision, this nonlinear, this imaginative uh, vision as well to balance that out. So if we look to the amazing poet, Mary Oliver, um, who we just lost to this plane anyway, just a few years ago, she had a quote, and I wanted to bring that to us today. She said, I don't know exactly what a prayer is. I don't know exactly what a prayer is. I do know how to pay attention how to fall down into the grass, how to kneel down in the grass. She said, I don't know exactly what a prayer is. I do know how to pay attention, how to fall down into the grass, how to kneel down in the grass. So says Mary Oliver. And so I think one of the things that the poetic vision about healing our connection with the natural world, that one part of that is to exchange praying to some abstract God, to exchange that for a reverence to the real, to what we find when we kneel down uh, on fresh earth, as Mary Oliver talks about. There's also a few lines of a poem by Patricia Hooper, and she says it like this. She says, if I sit still enough, if I sit still enough among the damp trees, sometimes I see the world without 
myself in it. And, and, it always surprises me. Nothing at all is lost. If I sit still enough among the damp trees, sometimes, sometimes, sometimes I see the world without myself in it. And, and, it always surprises me. Nothing at all is lost. Now for me, the thing that begins to come at me from these poetic words. And remember, you know, I love William Stafford's definition of poetry, which I have accepted as my own. A poem that's any words that causes us to stop and pay careful attention. So poetry is not some rarefied thing. It is something which is solid and real. And what I get from these lines from Patricia Hooper is that the only thing we can lose is the awareness, the awareness of our connections and our connection. Uh, Reminds me of the lines by the amazing um, biologist E.O. Wilson, who said, Homo sapiens is the only species to suffer psychological exile. Homo sapiens is the only species to suffer psychological exile. I think it was perhaps Alan Watts that once said, human beings are the only animal that can go against our own nature. And this also brings to mind as we're adding more poetic pieces, more poetic aphorisms. Of course, I love the idea that an aphorism, a good one, is simply a poem with bib overalls on. (laughs) I've always loved that. But speaking of amazing poets, let's look at a little ditty by Emily Dickinson. She said it like this. I think it's in this territory we're talking about. We're trying to balance out these facts. We're trying to fly underneath the radar screen of our logical, linear, strategic mind so that we can touch places in the heart that need touching, especially around such incredibly, existentially frightening issues. Emily Dickinson said, To make a prairie, it takes a clover and one bee. To make a prairie, it takes a clover and one bee. One clover and a bee and reverie. The reverie alone will do if bees are few. Now, I love that. I love that. I love so much of her work. And it just reminds you also that what we have to do, the healing of our relationship with the natural world, to try and do something about those facts that we started out with and many others as well, that we have to begin to really have reverence for, really listen to, really take cues from the natural world from which we are not separate, from which we are embedded. And even that word is not exactly right. We are not separate from the natural world. There was another piece, little poetic quip that I wanted to bring by someone who refers to herself as the wild gypsy poet. And she said, Listen, it is the trees who tell the future. Listen, it is the trees who tell the future in whispered songs through the leaves. Who will sing it then after they 
are gone. So again, such reverence in this case for trees in that um, in that piece. Now, um, the lost poem that we referenced, of course, um, these poem parts and aphorisms that I've been referring to or bringing to you, they all point stealthily to uh, the old beliefs that we must leave behind. They not only vision us toward the new, but as they midwife us toward the new, but they also have a kind of built-in hospice effect for the beliefs that we must actually leave behind. And some of those beliefs are that we've inherited over many, many years that nature is a blind, dumb machine. That's one of the things we've inherited and has gotten us exactly in the position that we're in today with the natural world. And rather than being blind, dumb machines, we realize through the poetic vision, through these poems and others, that the natural world is alive, is brilliant, is organic. The second uh, old belief, which has far and away exceeded its expiration date, is that nature and humans are separate versus they are not separate. We've been talking about this, but that is so true. And the poetic vision, the poems that I've been using in the aphorisms, um, really speak to the fact that we are not separate from the natural world. Number three um, is that um, humans are to control, that we are meant to control and dominate, actually fight the natural world, grab it and wrestle it down to the ground. You know, uh, that this is the old set of beliefs all around that dominate and control Notion. That's what has been handed down. That is what that we can no longer afford to embrace. Uh, the truth is that we are here to integrate, to cooperate, and to rejuvenate, working inside of nature as an integral part. You know, the great scientist and thinker Einstein once famously said that we can't make changes at the level of thinking that created them. And I would say that we can't change feelings and attitudinal stances in the world at the level of thinking and feeling that created them. Here would be a good place for me to mention one of my, perhaps my favorite poet, William Stafford, once said, and boy, when I say favorite poet, that's among many, many poets. And anybody that I mention on this podcast today and in future podcasts, I am totally suggesting that you seek their work, that you get their poems, and that you marinate yourself in their poetry and any of the other poets and poems that you fall in love with. But William Stafford said, the greatest ownership of all is to look around and understand. Whoa. I love that. The greatest ownership of all is to look around and understand. And to me, this idea of understanding, and again, I keep coming back to this theme because I think it's so important. And sometimes it's so counterintuitive that to understand fully, we need to engage the mind, the head, the intellect with, of course, proper facts and reality, 
And at the same time, we also need to engage the heart with, as we've been saying, these visions, these poetic visions. We need to engage the heart with imagery, with nonlinear um, thinking, I guess you would say. So let me say and switch gears here a little bit along the same theme. One of my deeply appreciated mentors over the years was the uh, longtime legendary Stanford University president, I'm sorry, professor. (laughs) He could have been the president. Uh, Would have been a good one. Would have made a good one. But anyway, he was a, a... legendary professor at Stanford. His name was James March. And I met Jim, uh, as it turns out, late in his life, about a a couple of years before he died. And I had some wonderful conversations and visits with him during the uh, two years or so that uh, I had the fortune, the great fortune, to uh, hang out with him a little bit. And uh, in one of our conversations, and here's why I'm bringing this up, I think it's pertinent. He once said he was a he was a uh, was an amazing. He was in the business. He taught in the business school. He taught in so in the sociology department. He taught in a number of of different areas. He was a great bringer together of knowledge. But he once said that great leaders uh, must be one part plumber and one part poet. Now, that's the quote that I found, by the way, that had me track him down, and he was so generous, so amazingly generous. Uh, And then once I tracked him down, I found out that he himself was a poet, and we'll talk about that in just a moment. But what I think he meant, and what I know he meant, is that when he said great leaders must be one part plumber and one part poet, is that They must have one foot in the world of logical linear facts and the other foot in the world of nonlinear, intuitive, imaginative, metaphorically rich language and facts of a different sort. And I want to indicate that I think all of us must be one part plumber and one part poet, especially as it relates to some of these more difficult situations we face um, around challenges with our connection and relationship with the natural world. Now, um, I was able to share poems during the times that I visited and hung out with uh, Jim March, and, and he, one of the Many poems we shared. We shared poems by, um, you know, other poets, but we also shared a few of our own. And one that he sent me, very short little poem, which I think is is uh, relevant to our discussion. He said, the poem is called A Little Longer. He said it like this. My candle burns, my candle burns in a holder next to yours. It is flickering now, and so is yours. Still, still your flame lights up my life, and I want to stay a little longer, if I can. My candle burns in a holder next to yours. It is flickering now, and so is yours. Still, your flame lights up my life, and I want to stay a little longer, if I can. Now, Jim wrote that poem about his teenage sweetheart, which became his wife, Jane, who I also met. Um although she was having some uh, challenges uh, by the time I met her, some cognitive challenges. And Jane 
passed away during this period, of course, and she passed away about one month before um, or about one month after she passed away, Jim also died. And he had written this poem or shared it with me, oh, probably in the last year of his life. And uh, I don't know if I, I think I mentioned this, they'd been together 71 years. And you just begin to see the depth, the wonderful depth in that short little poem of their relationship. And of course, I saw that. I saw evidence of that. Even though she was in cognitive decline, uh, he still, they still related to one another uh, with amazing tenderness and caring, and he to her with such reverence. And I think that what this says to us is it is a amazing lesson on what it means to be in an amazing relationship. And uh, they were in an amazing relationship. And notice how slant and stealth this poem is. But if we just tilt our heads just a little bit, we can see how our collective candles now burn in the holder next to and embedded within the natural world. Jim, with this poem about his beloved wife, is giving us a lesson about relationships and our own relationships to the natural world. Okay. Okay, with that, that wraps, or that is a wrap for this first edition of Dale Byron's Poetry Podcast, A Fresh Glimpse of Knowing. Now, if you like what you heard, please like and subscribe at your favorite podcast podcast source. And if you believe, as I do, that the facts in any given situation are critical yet must be enhanced with the power and emotional heft of poetry, then for sure subscribe because that's going to be our theme, uh, ongoing theme with this podcast. Also, I would ask that if you're so motivated and inclined to comment on any hits you had about the poems, the podcast, and of course the theme, uh, because I hope I have whetted your appetite to seek out these poems and poets, as I've already mentioned here. They are brilliant, and having their work at hand will give you critical tools you need to stay more centered, aware, engaged, and yes, even happy. And in your comments, uh, if there are hits that you had that, you know, I only thought of certain things, there are maybe secrets and hits and amazing insights that you've had that I've not even touched on. And it would be wonderful for all of us if you would share those with us again in the comments. So there, that is a wrap. Stay tuned for future podcasts featuring more great poetry on a weekly basis. And until the next podcast, you take good care of yourself. 